Welcome to the GDPR Weekly Show, one of the top five GDPR podcasts worldwide. Here is what's coming up in this week's episode. Welcome to episode 191 of the GDPR Weekly Show, the number one GDPR podcast worldwide. Coming up in this week's episode, we have news of a data breach at the UK Home Office. We have news of a data breach at Shiseido, UK. And then we have a decision from the ICO that there be no further action after the CCTV breach which saw the downfall of Matt Hancock, who was the House Secretary in the Conservative government during COVID. We then have news that an alleged breach of GDPR by TikTok has reached the UK High Court. And we then have a, something of a did-they-didn't-they situation between Anonymous and Nestle. We then move to Russia, where a data breach at Russian food delivery service Yandex Food has revealed details of members of the Russian security services. And then to the Netherlands, where the Dutch DPA has issued guidance that emphasises the importance of GDPR data transparency. Then we travel to the USA, where Arizona and Indiana have changed their data breach reporting requirements. And then to Florida, where Lakeview Loan Servicing has had a data breach. We then travel up to Canada, where Queen's University has had a data breach. And we mainly in Canada, Conti has claimed responsibility for a cyber attack on Panasonic Canada. We then travel to Sweden, where mobile phone manufacturer Ericsson has given notice of a data breach. And then to Kansas in the USA, where the Newman Regional Health Board has had a data breach. We then return to Canada, where MapleSoft has had a data breach. And then finally, we have news of a spat between ICANN, the domain regulator, and the EU, over DNS verification and the limitations placed on that by the introduction of GDPR. So as always, a wide range of articles for you this week. We hope you find the content of the articles useful and informative. We always welcome your feedback. So if you have any feedback for us, please do email us at feedback at gdprweeklyshow.com. We do read every single piece of feedback we receive, but unfortunately due to the volume of feedback, it's not always possible for us to respond to each piece of feedback individually. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. The UK Home Office's visa services apologised for a data breach in which the email addresses of more than 170 people were mistakenly copied into an email circulated last week. The message was sent on 7th of April 2022 about the change of location for a visa appointment with the UK Visa and Citizenship Application Service. The UK's Visa and Citizenship Application Service is run on behalf of the Home Office by the private contractor Sol Presteria. Some of the email addresses appear to be private email accounts, while others belong to lawyers from a variety of firms. Just after 5pm on the 8th of April, an email apologising for the data breach was circulated. It referred to a data breach error and apologised for any inconvenience caused. It stated, This email included the email addresses of other customers, which is not our usual practice. It did not include any other personal information. At the UK Visa and Citizenship Application Service, we take data protection very seriously. We are reviewing our internal processes to prevent this error from occurring in the future. Naga Candia of MTC Solicitors, one of the recipients of the email, said, If the Home Office wishes to outsource biometric appointments to a third-party company, they have to ensure that their partner is providing a service which is both legally compliant and good value for money. The UK Visa and Citizenship Application Service are charging for hour in excess of what was previously paid for an appointment at the post office, yet the product is inferior. For such a high price, clients do not expect GDPR breaches or loss of data. It's not the first time that the Home Office has had a problem with data breaches. Regular listeners may remember that they had a data breach of email addresses back in April 2019. And in the same month, the former Immigration Minister, Caroline Noakes, had to apologise to the Windrush generation after about 500 email addresses were mistakenly shared with recipients of a mailing list through the compensation scheme. We did contact the ICO to see if they were aware of the data breach, but they said the Home Office had not referred it. A Home Office spokesperson said, We take data protection extremely seriously and there are robust processes in place to prevent breaches. On the rare occasion they do occur, data incidents which meet the appropriate threshold are reported to the Information Commissioner's Office. Our data protection officer is reviewing the incident to determine whether this threshold has been met. Having reviewed this here at the GDPR Weekly Show, our opinion is that it does not need to into the ICO, but does of course need recording in the Home Office Data Breach Register. If you ever suffer a data breach yourselves and are uncertain whether you need to report it to your data protection authority, Please do contact us using the contact details that are coming up right now, and we'll be very pleased to give you our advice. Contact us on helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com. 
the UK branch of cosmetics giant Shiseido has reportedly fallen victim to a data breach involving personal details belonging to hundreds of former and current employees. The Japanese company has been accused of failing to notify the affected staff of their data including address information, passport and ID images and bank details have been stolen. Several Shiseido employees have reported being victims of fraud with their personal data being used to open fraudulent businesses as well as take out bank loans and insurance, according to testimonies obtained by beauty industry watchdog Estee Laundry. Shiseido's management and HR department had reportedly denied responsibility, refusing to contact its employees to alert them. We have had to contact its employees and staff ourselves, one anonymous source told Estee Laundry, adding that the company's HR and legal teams had refused to offer any help. This has resulted in some victims of the breach being forced to take on the scammers themselves, as well as cover the expenses of having their names cleared. After discovering in March that their personal information had been used to open a fraudulent business, another employee, who wished to remain anonymous, was forced to pay court fees to get themselves removed from the company. Another former employee said they had spent over a month deleting and deactivating accounts, while not knowing how scammers managed to obtain their personal data in the first place. In both cases, the victims were ultimately notified about the data breach by former Shiseido Tolly. The incident is said to be limited to Shiseido's UK branch. Shiseido is known to use single sign-on authentication provided by CyberArk Identity for its 30,000 employees worldwide. We approached Shiseido for a comment, but at the time we joined the broadcast, they've not come back to us. And we do hear from them. We will, of course, bring it to you in the next available episode of the Weekly Show. Do you ever wish there was a simple way to get to grips with GDPR? Well, now there is. Our best-selling book, GDPR Made Simple, is available on Amazon for just £7.99. It's a short, concise guide to all you need to know about UK GDPR. It's thoroughly recommended for everyone, whatever your level of experience with GDPR. So that's GDPR Made Simple on Amazon right now. If you're a regular listener to GDPR Weekly Show, then you might remember that back in episode 153... We brought you news that Matt Hancock's CCTV breach was being investigated by the ICO. Well, this week the ICO announced that no one will be prosecuted over the leak of CCTV footage of disgraced former Health Secretary Matt Hancock breaching COVID rules by kissing his departmental aide in his office. The watchdog said it has found insufficient evidence to prosecute two people who were suspected of unlawfully obtaining and disclosing the footage from the Department of Health and Social Care. The ICO said it has now closed its criminal probe, which saw two homes raided in the south of England and computers seized last year. The ICO launched its investigation after receiving a complaint of a data breach from the DHSC CCTV operator MTOR Group PLC. The watchdog said in a statement, Given the seriousness of the report and the wider implications it potentially had for the security of information across government, the ICO had a legal duty to carry out an impartial assessment of the evidence available to determine if there had been a breach of the law. Forensic analysis revealed that the leaked images were most likely obtained by someone recording CCTV footage screens with a mobile phone. Six phones retrieved during the execution of the search warrants did not contain the relevant CCTV footage. After taking legal advice, the ICO concluded there was insufficient evidence to charge anyone with criminal offences under the Data Protection Act 2018. The leak of the CCTV images and footage of Mr Hancock passionately embracing his assistant, Gina Toldolanjo, led to his resignation as House Secretary in June last year. He admitted to breaching the COVID rules that he himself had helped design. The Sun newspaper, which published the leaked CCTV footage, branded the ICO raid in July last year as an outrageous abuse that could deter whistleblowers from coming forward. Mr Hancock, who was married to his wife Martha when the CCTV footage was leaked, has since described how he broke COVID 19 guidelines because he fell in love. That's something that was completely outside of my control and I of course regret the pain that's caused and the very, very, very public nature but I fell in love with someone, he recently said. Back in episode 178 of the GDPR Weekly Show, we brought you news about TikTok having a judgment in the courts in the Netherlands. Well, we also now have news of a case against TikTok here in the UK. Judgment in various procedural matters in SMO versus TikTok Inc. and others, 2022, was handed down on the 8th of March. A summary judgment application will be heard in the coming months. SMO is a minor acting through a litigation friend, the former Children's Commissioner for England. She has brought claim as a representative under CPR 19.6, being the same route as that of Mr Lloyd against Google in a previous case. She alleges that data protection breaches and MPI by the TikTok platform of essentially UK and EEA child users and account holders. Due to the fact that various of the defendants are based outside the UK jurisdiction, one of the applications recently heard by Judge Nicklin 
was whether the representative claim had any real prospect of success in the light of the Lloyd v. Google case so as to allow for service outside the jurisdiction. The claimant argued that Lloyd was distinguishable on a number of grounds, including the fact that it had not been decided under UK GDPR and the Data Protection Act 2018, that the UK GDPR required no material damage to encompass loss of control, that the class of claimants was comprised of children who actually used TikTok at a material time, and that there was an MPI claim, and that was intent- intrusive processing of personal data leading to de minimis threshold being crossed. Importantly, only the UK-based TikTok entity was heard out of six defendants. That was a powerful factor leading to judges' confusion that permission to serve out of jurisdiction should be given, so argument about summary judgment of defendants' favour could be heard in the future with the benefit of submissions from others. The summary judgment application will have to engage with Lloyd and the hurdles that arose in that case in respect to the representative class action and the effect of non-availability in English law of mere loss of control damages. For reasons that can easily be seen from the strict domestic cases referred to, the arguments have the potential to reverberate within the UK and indeed around the world. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. Okay, so did they, didn't they now? The hacktivist group Anonymous boasted they obtained and dumped on the internet 10 gigabytes of multinational Nestle's records including emails, passwords and customer information, leading some to assume it was stolen during a network intrusion. However, Nestle now says that the data is not real or sensitive, it wasn't stolen, and it was accidentally leaked by Nestle themselves. This claim of a cyber attack against Nestle and subsequent data leak has no foundation, a spokesperson for Nestle said. It relates to a case from February this year, when some randomised and predominantly publicly available test data of a B2B nature was unintentionally made accessible online for a short period of time on a single business test website. We quickly investigated and no further action was deemed necessary. Cyber security is one of our top priorities. We continuously monitor the IT landscape and take all actions needed to ensure we stay cyber security resilient. 10 gigabytes of data is actually just 6 megabytes that unpacks to less than 100 megabytes of plain text SQL database dump. These primarily list what's said to be purchase orders from stores and Nestle partners. A lot of the data appears to be made up complete with at example.com email addresses or uses publicly available information such as the street addresses of shops and other vendors. There are a handful of real looking email addresses in there, mainly nestle.com ones and one or two from what appears to be an IT supplier. It does seem to be, as Nestle said, test data rather than a full blown internet leak. Separately, in a statement posted to its website on Wednesday, Nestle voiced its support for Ukraine and its 5,800 employees who work in the country. Nestle said it was cutting ties with Russia and President Putin's invasion of his neighbouring nation. As war rages in Ukraine, our activities in Russia will focus on providing essential foods such as infant foods and medical hospital nutrition, not on making a profit, Nestle said. Any profit it does generate will be donated to humanitarian relief efforts. Going forward, we are suspending renowned Nestle brands such as Kit Kat and Nesquik, amongst others, the statement continued. We have already halted non-essential imports and exports into and out of Russia, stopped all advertising and suspended all capital investment in the country. Nestle's stance on Russia came in a few days after Anonymous called on all companies to halt sales and operations in Russia, pull out of Russia, we give you 48 hours to reflect and withdraw from Russia or else you will be under our target, the group said, along with an image showing logos of more than 40 brands including Nestle, Burger King, Cloudflare and Citrix. Contact us on helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com. Talking of Russia, a massive data leak from Russian food delivery service Yandex Food revealed that delivery addresses, phone numbers, names and delivery instructions belonging to those associated with Russia's secret police, according to findings from Bellingcat. Yandex Food, a subsidiary of the larger Russian internet company Yandex, first reported the data leak on March 1st blaming it on dishonest actions of one of its employees and noting that the leak did not include users' login information. Russian communications regulator Roscoe Mansour has since threatened to fine the company up to 100,000 rubles for the leak, which Reuters say exposed information from about 58,000 users. The regulator also blocked access to an online map containing the data and attempted to conceal the information of ordinary citizens, as well as those with ties to the Russian military and security services. Researchers at Bellingcat gained access to the trove of information, sifting through it for leads of any people of the internet, such an individual leaked to the poisoning of Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny. 
by searching the database for phone numbers collected as part of a previous investigation, Valentia uncovered the name of the person who was in contact with Russia's Federal Security Service, the FSB, to plan the Roundy's poisoning. Valentiat says this person also used his work email address to register with Yandex Food, allowing researchers to further ascertain his identity. Researchers also examined the leaked information for the phone numbers belonging to individuals tied to Russian's main intelligence directorate, the GRU, or the country's foreign military intelligence agency. They found the name of one of these agents, Vedeni, and were able to link him to Russia's Ministry of Foreign Affairs and find his vehicle registration information. Valentiat uncovered some valuable information by searching the database for specific addresses as well. When researchers looked for the GRU headquarters in Moscow, they found just four results. A potential sign that workers don't use the delivery app or opt to order from restaurants within walking distance instead. When Ballantyak searched for FSB's Special Operations Centre in Moscow suburb, however, it yielded 20 results. Several results contained interesting delivery instructions warning drivers the delivery location is actually a military base. One user told the driver, go up to the three boom barriers near the blue booth and call. After the stop for bus 110, up to the end, when another said, close territory, go to the checkpoint, call the number 10 minutes before you arrive. In a tweet, Navalny supporter Lubov Sobel said the leaked information even led to additional information about Russian President Vladimir Putin's former mistress and their alleged secret daughter. Thanks to the leaked Yandex database, another apartment of Putin's ex-mistress was found, Sobel said. That's where their daughter ordered her meals. The apartment is understood to be worth around 170 million rubles. That's about just under 2 million US dollars. Do you ever wish there was a simple way to get to grips with GDPR? Well, now there is. Our best-selling book, GDPR Made Simple, is available on Amazon for just £7.99. It's a short, concise guide to all you need to know about UK GDPR. It's thoroughly recommended for everyone, whatever your level of experience with GDPR. So that's GDPR Made Simple on Amazon right now. To the Netherlands now, and a €565,000 fine faced by the Dutch Ministry of Foreign Affairs for data protection breaches demonstrates why it's crucial for data controllers to follow transparency principles under GDPR. The GDPR transparency principle establishes that people must be able to find and understand the information that data processes share with them, and that processes must provide the information in a reasonable time frame. Processes must also inform the data subjects of changes and further processing of their data. In this particular case, the Dutch Data Protection Authority, the DDPA, found flaws in the way data in the National Visa Information System, the NVIS, was handled and shared. The Ministry of Foreign Affairs processes a special personal data of roughly 530,000 visa applicants through the NVIS every year, including fingerprints and passport photos. Stricter security requirements apply to special personal data, which the DDPA said were not followed at various Dutch embassies and consulates abroad that access the NVIS. While a vulnerability analysis of the system had been made, the regulator found it had not been updated since 2015. There was also a lack of information about the physical security of NBIS, and there were no procedures for logging checks. Logs that were created were incomplete, and it was not possible to identify which employees had access to data in the system. The protocols for reporting security issues were also inadequate, according to the DDPA, since the Ministry used a manual for recording incidents that only contained general advice for employees. There were no procedures specifically designed for MVIS, as there should have been. While the regulator did find an authorization procedure for access to data stored in the MVIS, it had only been implemented in January 2022. The DDPA ordered a raft of reforms to the way the Ministry handled data, including a new information security policy for the MVIS, regular checks of user rights, and logging actions within the system. The Ministry faced an additional penalty of €50,000 for every fortnight while the breach continues, up to a maximum of a further half a million euros. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. To America now, and Arizona recently amended its breach notice law to change the regulator notification requirements. Starting this summer, depending on the scope of the incident, the Arizona Department of Homeland Security will need to be notified. Specifically, as amended, if more than 1,000 Arizona individuals are notified of a breach, the notification must be made to the three largest consumer reporting agencies, the Arizona Attorney General and the Arizona Department of Homeland Security. Previously, only the consumer reporting agencies and Arizona Attorney General needed to be notified if the threshold was met. This notification should be made within 45 days after the determination there had been a breach. 
and was then adjoined to New York as being one of the few states that required notification to multiple state regulatory agencies. Indiana has also made a minor amendment to its data breach notification law. Starting on July the 1st, companies who are obligated to notify under the law must do so to affected individuals and the Indiana Attorney General without unreasonable delay, but no later than 45 days after the discovery of the breach. This changes the current time frame, which is without unreasonable delay. Indiana joins many other states that impose a specific timing requirement, in particular no later than 45 days after determining there's been a breach, for example, Alabama, Maryland, Ohio and Wisconsin. Remaining in America and travelling to Florida, Lakeview Loan Servicing disclosed a massive data breach that went undetected for over a month last autumn and compromised the personal information of over 2 million customers. The company, which claims it's the nation's fourth largest servicer, said in public notices that the breach impacted 2,537,261 borrowers between October 27, 2021 and December 7, 2021 and was unidentified in early December. An unauthorised person obtained access to the firm's servers and information including names, addresses, loan information and social security numbers, according to notices, one of which said the incident was an external system breach. We've reached out to Lakeview for more information and when we receive that we will bring it to you in the next robot episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. Contact us on helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com to Canada now and Queen's University has apologised to students and is offering support after student information in the life sciences department was disseminated via email on April the 7th. The information included student identifiers, student names, student numbers, academic plans and years of study as of September 2021. Student sexes and email addresses were also compromised. In an email regarding the incident, Catherine Rudder, Life Services Programme Advisor, said she inadvertently attached an Excel class list file compi- containing the compromise information to an email sent out to all fourth year life sciences students. The subject of the email was a networking opportunity. The email message was recorded immediately and information technology services has worked quickly to delete the email and attachment, Rudder said. Mark Erdman, Manager of Community Relations, clarified the data breach occurred for all life sciences students except first years in the email sent on behalf of the university. Erdman noted the university takes data breaches seriously and makes efforts to mitigate any negative effects students might face. Information Technology Services was contacted and has deleted all copies of the email and the attachment in question. The department quickly notified all students in life sciences of the breach and what personal information had been disclosed, he said. Erdman expressed regret on behalf of the university and apologised to everyone affected. Life Sciences students with questions can contact the Associate Dean, Louise Wynne, Life Sciences and Biochemistry, he said. Students needing wellness support can contact Empower Me, Good to Talk, a 24-7 support line for post-secondary students or the Student Wellness Services. Do you ever wish there was a simple way to get to grips with GDPR? Well, now there is. Our best-selling book, GDPR Made Simple, is available on Amazon for just £7.99. It's a short, concise guide to all you need to know about UK GDPR. It's thoroughly recommended for everyone, whatever your level of experience with GDPR. So that's GDPR Made Simple on Amazon right now. Remaining in Canada, and Japanese technology giant Panasonic confirmed that its Canadian operations were hit by a cyber attack in February that impacted internal systems, processes and networks. In a statement, Panasonic spokesperson Erin Minobe said, We took immediate action to address the issue with assistance from cybersecurity experts and our service providers. This includes identifying the scope of the impact, containing the malware, cleaning and restoring servers, rebooting applications, and communicating rapidly with affected customers and relevant authorities. Panasonic did not confirm if the incident was a result of a ransomware attack, what data was accessed, or how many people were impacted by the data breach. However, the Tronti ransomware group has claimed responsibility for the attack and claimed to have more than 2.7 gigabytes of data from Panasonic Canada. According to Tronti, they have Panasonic's internal files, spreadsheets and documents belong to HR and accounting departments. Panasonic say they're working to restore operations and understand how the incident impacted customers, employees and stakeholders, while making it a priority to work closely with affected parties to mitigate the impacts of the cyber attack. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. To Sweden now, and mobile phone manufacturer Ericsson has issued a notice of a data breach. 
Everton say we have drawn the conclusion that a limited number of confidential documents pertaining to information detailed in a 2019 internal investigation by the company related to activities in Iraq has been disclosed to unauthorised parties outside the organisation. We have reported the authorised disclosure to the Swedish Authority for Privacy Protection as a personal data breach. We are currently conducting a data security investigation and have taken appropriate actions to address the personal data breach, mitigate its possible adverse effect and reinforce existing security measures. Access to the disclosed documents was restricted to a limited group of individuals within Ericsson. There is no indication that the unauthorised disclosure was caused by ransomware attacks or systematic data security vulnerabilities. The investigation undertaken to date suggests the unauthorised disclosure was caused by a single violation of internal guidelines. The disclosed document contained personal data between 100 and 200 employees, former employees, business partners and their business partners. No customer data has been disclosed. The nature of the personal data varies but typically includes names and employment status and title. Some personal data in the disclosed documents are of a sensitive nature. Potential consequences of the personal data breach for affected data subjects are difficult to foresee, but could, for example, include the loss of control over personal data and economic or social disadvantage. We have informed all the affected data subjects whose contact details we have been able to identify. Contact us on helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com. Returning to America now, and Newman Regional Health, based in Emporia, Kansas, recently confirmed a data breach stemming from the hacking IT incident involving one or more organisational email accounts. This investigation is still at a very early stage, but Newman Regional Health estimate that currently as many as 52,224 individuals could be affected. We're expecting an update from Newman Regional Health during this week, which we will bring to you in next week's episode of the GDPR Week Show. Do you ever wish there was a simple way to get to grips with GDPR? Well, now there is. Our best-selling book, GDPR Made Simple, is available on Amazon for just £7.99. It's a short, concise guide to all you need to know about UK GDPR. It's thoroughly recommended for everyone, whatever your level of experience with GDPR. So that's GDPR Made Simple on Amazon right now. We return to Canada now, and Maplesoft, a division of the Canadian software company Waterloo Maple, develops markets and sales mathematics-based software to engineers, educators and researchers in a variety of industries, including science, technology, engineering and mathematics. Maplesoft employs more than 130 employees with approximately $34 million in annual revenue. This week, Maplesoft released a notification to their customers that there had been a data breach. In their notification, they said, I am writing to you today to notify you of a data breach that recently occurred in our online store. We are reaching out to inform anyone who has been affected by the incident. Unfortunately, your payment card details, email, billing address and name may have been included in this data breach. On Thursday, April the 7th, 2022, we were contacted by a customer who suspected their payment card had been compromised following the transaction they completed in our store. During our investigation, we discovered that a malicious script had been placed in our online store. As a result, the perpetrators were able to gain access to financial information as customers made transactions. We took immediate action to secure our systems, which included temporarily shutting our down our online store and website. Because you completed a transaction in our store while the script was in place, we are notifying you about this breach. Microsoft went on to say, we have removed the malicious script from our online store, and we are actively monitoring our platforms and systems to ensure that no further customer data is compromised. We strongly recommend that you immediately contact your payment card provider and inform them of the breach so that they can issue you with a replacement card. We also recommend that you review your financial statements and report any suspicious transactions to your card provider. We sincerely apologise for the worry and inconvenience this incident has caused. If any Maplesoft customers have any queries, they are advised to contact Dale Horn, Maplesoft Data Protection Officer, at privacy at maplesoft.com. You're listening to the GDPR Weekly Show with your host, Keith Budden. And finally this week, we have news that ICANN, the domain regulator, has got into something of a spat with the European Commission and the European Union's toolbox against counterfeiting over GDPR. The toolbox against counterfeiting and associated report analysed DNS abuse and what to do about it. The ICANN business constituency previously submitted feedback to the EU and now ICANN has contributed, but after the deadline. ITAN explained the limited role that it plays in the internet and also stated ITAN is not the internet's content police. But it also took the opportunity to pass the buck back to the EU 
for making it harder to investigate DNS abuse at the domain level. It wrote, GDPR has fragmented the system that many rely on for reasons as varied as law enforcement investigations, intellectual property and security incident response, amongst others. GDPR, it said, makes it hard to check the accuracy of registration data. In addition, GDPR affected ICANN org's ability to investigate inaccuracy of registration data and take steps to address it with GTRD registrars. Pre-GDPR, ICANN org investigated the accuracy of GTLD registration data both in response to external complaints and in the context of the Who Is Accuracy Reporting System project, in which ICANN org proactively identified potential inaccuracies and addressed them with registrars. This project was paused upon the effective date of GDPR, given that much of the resident contact information is now redacted from public view and thus not accessible for analysis. We've not had any feedback from this from the EU Commission as we go to broadcast, but if we do get feedback, we'll bring it to you in the next available episode of the GDPR Weekly Show. Contact us on helpdesk at gdprweeklyshow.com The GDPR Weekly Show is an insurer production. Until next time, bye-bye.